and guests to this discussion of the UN Global Compact for Business. The goal of the next 45 minutes is to relate the significant and impactful work of this gifted group to the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact and to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Just very briefly, the 10 principles of the UNGC are human rights support, non-complicity and abuses, freedom of association and right to collective bargaining, no forced labor, abolition of child labor, no employment discrimination, a precautionary approach to environmental challenges, uh, promotion of environmental responsibility, encouragement of environmental friendly technology, and an anti-corruption piece. We will uh, limit initial remarks to four to five minutes, and I'll give each of you sort of a heads up 30, minute, 30 seconds ahead of time. And then we'll follow that with as much productive Q&A as time permits. Uh, without further ado, uh, we'll go in alphabetical order, and I'll, and I'll leave to each of you to briefly uh, uh, describe your affiliation. First up, Juco. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I'm Jouko Ahvenainen, and my background is that uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I have started many companies around the world in Asia, Europe, and U.S. Uh, I have worked also as an investor and uh, been also very active to develop a fintech area during the last 10 years. And um, I, I want to focus especially in this finance and fintech area because as a whole, this is very large area, and uh, 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 I see that actually to develop the finance models is very important part of this. Uh, we all know that without finance, nothing can happen. And especially when we talk, for example, about susta sustainability and equal opportunities and better opportunities around the world, it's also very important to develop the finance system so that it can support all these targets. And um, I especially want to emphasize three important points. One is that uh, how we can better guarantee finance uh, for all these activities and what could be the finance models. The second one is linked uh, also to accounting so that basically how we can uh, basically not only men measure uh, uh, financial return, but also other targets and aspects uh, what we have. And the third one is especially how, how, how to make the finance and funding more equal so that people around the world could have better opportunities to get the finance and, and basically uh, develop all these activities. Um, there, there are quite a lot of activities in this area, but the one area I want to emphasize especially are the new finance models, including uh, fintech. Meaning, for example, platforms uh, like uh, crowdfunding, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, micro-lending, and, and this kind of uh, digital models basically to offer finance very globally. And so it's, it's not only depending on large finance institutions, but individual people could also better uh, participate to develop the finance. Then, of course, uh, uh, there, there are also other important aspects like, for example, public and private partnerships, so that how the uh, basic, basically the private fi finance can work, for example, with uh, public finance sources. Uh, so uh, I, I think that as an opening, I, I, I just want to mention these uh, main areas that the new finance models, new models uh, to, to measure the results and basically the platforms are very important aspect to develop all these targets. Thank you. Yuko, you still have a minute. Welcome to Rai. Uh, that's fine though. We'll use we'll use that time. We'll have plenty of productive uses for it. Next up, we're going in alphabetical order. So Rai, you are just in time. 
for your initial remarks. Terrific. Well, thanks so much, uh, William. Great to be on with uh, with all of you. My name is Ryan Barker, and I lead an organization uh, founded by veterans in the United States called With Honor. I had served in the Marine Corps, and our organization is helping to build a cross-partisan coalition currently with 25 members of Congress uh, from both parties in the United States to take a pledge to serve with integrity, uh, civility, and courage, and then work together. Uh, they meet uh, once every uh, two weeks and work on uh, uh, legislative items that really matter for the world, which, which ties into to the, um, the topic today. Uh, a number of the items that are really top of mind for this group are in the intersection of uh, business and security, and um, I look forward to, to diving into that more uh, with this uh, great panel. So appreciate being, being here. Uh, Rye, again, well, I've, I've been t perhaps been overly, overly harsh. We, we certainly have a couple more minutes. Uh, but how are you? Uh, how, how would you characterize the, the current political climate vis-a-vis uh, -vis the work of work of your members? How active are they in this? evenly divided Senate and with a, a number of big issues at the fore. How would you characterize the current situation? Yeah, the, 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 the culture and the tension, tensions are very high still, as, as, we, as might, might, might be expected, given the level of polarization throughout Congress. Uh, this is uh, really a, a one area which is a, a glimmer of hope. Uh, that ties in part to the common foundation that, that these uh, members of Congress uh, have with each other, which is that they served in the military. And when you serve in in the military in the United States, it's an all volunteer force, and you you serve with people that uh, come from all different backgrounds, have all different points of view, uh, and and are, are united behind a common mission. Uh, and so uh, so that's what binds them. And the the members there are twenty five of them, and we invest uh, equally across party lines with Honor does. Uh, they're also motivated just by actions and actually getting things done. Uh, one concrete example of that is that uh, the, the uh, group, the Four Country Caucus, advocated for the expansion of national service uh, in the United States. And uh, national service is largely uh, conducted through AmeriCorps. Uh, that organization has not expanded for, for decades uh, but uh, the Four Country Caucus and With Honor was successful in, in seeing a very significant expansion uh, in the last uh, American Rescue Act uh, that will increase AmeriCorps by over 30 percent for young Americans to serve and, uh, and be in communities across the country, rural, urban, you name it, uh, spending a year uh, giving back to the country, uh, typically after they finish high school or, or college. And that's a that's a model that. Um, uh, that it, we think is very important for the country, but also really helps unify and build additional cohesion and trust by, frankly, getting 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 things done. Because there's no shortage of issues that actually really matter for the United States, for the world that uh, that cross party lines. Uh, but it is increasingly difficult to not only find that common ground, but create spaces where there's enough trust for. For individuals to um, to effectively work together and and uh, and get some things done. Thank, thanks, thanks, Ryan. That's that's a fuller explanation. Stuart, you're up. I was President uh, Carter's chief White House domestic policy advisor in the Clinton administration. I was ambassador to the European Union, Under Secretary of Commerce for National Trade, Under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs, and Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, the new global compact strategy for 2021-2023 is a bold effort to strengthen, broaden, and accelerate embedding the 10 principles in the original compact into corporate practice and effect monetizing them. It's an important to recognize a degree to which the compact has been transformative. For example, World Economic Forum in Davos has helped broaden acceptance of measurable so-called SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and most recently got over 100 member companies to agree that they would be part of their formal financial statement. The U.S. Business Roundtable, with America's largest corporations, has recently adopted the concept that corporations exist not only to reward their shareholders, but to deal fairly with their stakeholders, 
employees, workers, supply chains, and the environment in which they work. Major investors like BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, and I served on their fund board for 17 years, Larry Fink, have stated that they will invest in companies which take on these SGE goals, not just because it's a good thing to do, but because these companies with good corporate social practices will be the most profitable and the most attractive to consumers in the 21st century. Very recently, the European Union, to which I had been ambassador, has developed what they call a taxonomy, and the UK is considering one of their own. And under the EU taxonomy, investors who want to invest in portfolios of green companies and companies which follow SDG goals can be assured that in doing so, they have a vetting process in which the standards of SDG will be met by the companies in which they invest. It's a very bold new strategy. I was also the chief U.S. negotiator for the Kyoto Protocols in 1977 in the U.N.-sponsored COP3. And later this year, Secretary of State uh, John Kerry, former Secretary of State, will lead the U.S. negotiations in Glasgow for COP26, also under U.N. auspices. The progression from when I started to John Kerry's now in Glasgow is dramatic. In 1997, with Kyoto, there was no buy-in by developing countries who angrily pointed their fingers at the U.S. and the West for causing the problem of climate change. And then they said trying to retard their development as they were begin beginning their industrialization and refused to even take voluntary commitments. Likewise, at Kyoto, the business community in that era was largely hostile. We established innovations like the Clean Development Mechanism to try to encourage developed and developing country cooperation around clean energy. But, frankly, it was not significantly successful. But things are beginning to change. By the 2015 Paris Accords, the science of climate change had become more accepted and the economic and environmental consequences more evident and more stark. All countries under the leadership at that time of John Kerry, took nationally determined, though differentiated, differentiated commitments. Now, as we go to Glasgow and COP26, just in a few months, it is hoped that ambitious targets for reaching carbon neutrality by 2050 will be taken with a large fund by developed countries to help developing nations meet their commitments. Increasingly, developing countries recognize not only the need to be part of the solution, which they didn't in 1997, but that clean energy is crucial to their own sustainable development. And under President Biden, the U.S. is again taking a leadership role. Importantly, corporate America is now light years from where they were in Kyoto in 1997, stepping up with companies like General Motors, making major commitments to dramatically reduce their emissions. The UN Global Compact Strategy 2021-23 should now seek to have each of its 12,000 companies take concrete emission reduction targets and annually report to the UN on the concrete steps they're taking to achieve these targets. It's now time to move from vague statements of principles to concrete monitored action. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Very, that's a extraordinarily valuable oversight overview. Carolyn, you're up. Thank you, and thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I've uh, had an opportunity in my lifetime to be a diplomat, to be a banker, to be a Wall Street investor, a management consultant, a coach, and my focus is really to help leaders and teams actually solve wicked problems, meaning what has never been solved before, to design new solutions. And I think I'd like to take this conversation a little bit to the future around reimagining what's possible. You know, this last year, the Great Pause has actually had us stop to realize that um, the impossible is possible and that we have an opportunity to actually reimagine what we think. So when I think about monetizing the UN Global Compact, number one, I want to challenge the word monetizing. 
to make sure that we understand that this goes way beyond revenue today. But it really is about the wealth of nations, the wealth of the planet, in terms of how do we really think about what's possible for an environmentally sustainable, socially just, spiritually fulfilling human presence on the planet to move from surviving to thriving. I wanna put out the concept that we actually have an opportunity to think about regeneration as opposed to sustainability. And a great example of that is the work that Paul Hawkins with about 300 scientists around the world did lot two years ago in the, uh, his book Drawdown, where they actually took a look at 100 current practices that if they were scaled, we could actually reduce carbon emissions as opposed to just have them slow down. And of these top 100, two of the top 10 were the education of girls and the empowerment of women. So taken together, those two ideas would, do, would actually reverse global warming if done on a global scale. So what does this mean for business? When we think about business model, I'd like to define that as just how companies choose to organize their tangible and intangible assets in a way that creates the most value for others. And now I'm talking about the planet and everyone in it. I've spent a lot of time working with corporations on their culture around diversity, equity, and inclusion. But this progress has been so slow when you think about it. To be able to think about sustainability and regeneration, you know, imagine if organizations really knew that their top job was to be a leadership academy, to be able to really think about how to bring women and historically underrepresented groups to truly represent in decision-making in all areas, what is requisite for the world, we could actually move from group think to group genius and drive innovation and reimagination way beyond what we're currently doing. So that's sort of the area that I would love us to lean into as we think about what's possible. Thank you very much, very valuable. And Lisa last, but not least. Thank you so much. And I said before that the sun was going to come up here. So you're seeing the sun, the sun coming up here in Australia. Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, I, 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 I'm sort of entering this discussion more from the perspective of my work in international trade and um, global supply chains, um, which um, is my background, um, particularly also working in inclusive trade initiatives that uh, prioritize supporting uh, women in trade and minority business groups um, to internationalize. Um, so um, I'm really pleased to join uh, this this panel um, from, from here in Australia, um, particularly, I guess, hearing from the, the other global perspectives. Um, from my perspective, um, one of the things I'm interested in is that um, when Accenture surveyed more than 700 members of the United Nations Global Compact on sustainable business practices, about 96% of CEOs agreed that sustainability should be integrated into all aspects of strategy and operations. And 88% of them singled out the value chain as an area of significant importance. Yet only 54% of those CEOs affirmed that they had actually achieved value chain sustainability, um, which also is pretty evident in terms of their transparency in their supply chain, in terms of knowing maybe their tier one, tier two suppliers. But once you go beyond that, the um, transparency and um, accountability is less known. So one of the areas that we are working on, um, and we are doing this with the Bloomberg New Economy Solution, is to look at how we can work to build 
a framework that would provide a solution to provide more transparency in supply chains around visibility on this, but not at the detriment to particularly small to medium enterprises entering a value chain. Our goal is really to work in a way that we could provide an overarching framework of standards that would provide the transparency and traceability required in supply chains, particularly when you're looking at some of these issues around modern slavery, um, environmental impact, um, but to ensure that as we work towards a solution, what it is actually doing is benefiting the integration of uh, small businesses, particularly from least developing economies, to actually get greater access into value chain opportunities, whilst also working to achieve um, the, the, the UN's goals. So that, that's the approach that we're working on and we are looking at um, because we look at it to, uh, from both sides of the integration of where multinationals are going, where consumers are going, but also then how do we not allow this to be at a detriment to developing economies and small businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, a couple of things come to mind, and I'll, I'll try and uh, frame it to touch on as many as we can of, of, of your excellent points. Uh, I happen to be chair of, a, of an NGO called Little Sun, uh, Renewable Energy in Africa, uh, where our, our business plan, if you will, uh, is – Includes as many uh, of the SDGs as we as we can in the guise of distributing personal solar devices to uh, off grid areas in Africa, and what we've run up against after an extremely successful several years is just a is just a dead stop uh, because of and we had as many as five million euros in uh, foundation funding that's declined by eighty percent. Why? Supply chain. Uh, we can't get we can't get the material from China. Uh, we're low on the supply chain totem pole. Uh, plastic is another issue, but we put that aside. And also, um, commodity chip not not a special specialty chip is just a simple commodity chip. Uh, and again, we don't have the market power uh, to to command, and that's put us six to nine months behind. So, so, so COVID slash supply chain are very much impacting uh, the drawdown principles, Carolyn. Uh, and we have on our uh, board, Rachel Kite, who's a former uh, top UN sustainable energy for all. So we've got a world-class board and we're running up against some real world constraints. So uh, that might be one area that we can focus on. Where are we really? Uh, in in the aftermath of a quite devastating 16 month halt in and now restart in economic activity, um, and I, I'm also struck by and I, I need Stuart and a couple of you to comment. My sense of the of the of the UN Global Compact is it's is it's top heavy. It's major corporation, U.S. and Western Europe leaders those with the wherewithal, those with the ability uh, to, to truly develop sustainably, uh, that's 12,000 businesses, but only 55 million, uh, I forget what it is, 55 million workers. So Lisa or Stuart, how, how do we penetrate the SMEs globally uh, and, and JUCO? Uh, a number of you could comment on how do we broaden this this base? The base dramatically needs to be broadened if we're going to truly meet uh, the SDGs and if we're going to truly meet our climate mandate. So those are a couple of food for thought. Who wants to jump in? Let's try and keep this uh, snappy as we can. I'll, I'll just uh, start by saying that one of the keys is really the supply chain, is getting large corporations to embed a requirement in their supply chains, which are oftentimes SMEs, uh, to meet the same goals that they're taking, and not just to insist that in order to continue to be suppliers and to have inputs into their products, 
that they have to meet these goals and demonstrate that they're doing so. And, and uh, Stuart, how does that, Lisa, how does that relate to uh, uh, an enforcement mechanism or COP26 or is this just encouragement or how, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do, how do we mandate that that starts to happen? Um, well, one of the things that we have been working on, and it's not going to happen overnight, um, uh, but we are working, um, as I said, with the, with Bloomberg, um, New Economy and the International Chamber of Commerce is, is looking at how to think about this from a perspective of a standard framework, um, that could be enforced, um, at a regulatory perspective, um, in a way in which we start to standardize the process by which um, procurement happens. Um, and with that, you start to bring along a harmonized standards framework, the issue that we have. And one of the issues that we have is that there are thousands and thousands of standards uh, that, that a business has to comply with. And then on top of that, a multinational will have their own framework for procurement. This all precludes uh, the ability for a small business, particularly from uh, a, an emerging economy, to look at opportunities and access to value chain um, um, opportunities. So one of the things we're trying to work on is how to, how to standardise that process and then how do you then help and work on the ground with those small medium enterprises to ensure that they can actually um, comply with those requirements. Because, for example, I mean, I'm looking at some of the requirements from Marks and Spencers, for example, where they look all the way down their value chain to the smallest producer in Thailand to ensure that they are complying with our environmental standards. Uh, I mean, these are small micro businesses that are just one cog in the wheel of the supply chain. But those compliance requirements are heavily expensive for them so what we are trying to work on is to remove the barriers and the costs for those businesses by looking at frameworks and standards and compliance requirements and rules that would make it more easy through a standardization process juco uh when you when you hear this and when you you look through the lens of new financing models and let's just focus on smes um a particular interest of mine would be in capital markets develop development in developing countries. But in any event, uh, how, how do you react? How how where where is the dearth of, of financing uh, alternatives most acute? And I would think your answer would be SMEs. And how how do you how do you begin to attack this in a systematic way and get capital so that these SMEs can indeed. Uh, be valued members of the value chain, so to speak. Yeah, maybe I start with something more fundamental, that in certain way I feel that these kind of activities are easily very top-heavy. So so that it, it means that there is quite a lot of uh, regulation, restrictions, and uh, could I say that... Many small companies can also see that uh, that there might be restrictions that make actually their activities more complex. And of course, the uh, the target should be almost opposite, uh, meaning that how this could offer more opportunities for new companies, basically to make, for example, better and more effective solutions that would uh, basically offer then. Better, better value from all aspects. And uh, uh, I, I, I think that when we think, for example, the supply chain, it is one example that, uh, that it can be done in many ways. One way can be that it will be very difficult and hard for SMEs to be in supply chain. And the other way is then that how we could develop models that they could be actually more opportunities for new startups that are doing things in a new way. And um, I, I, I think that one challenge always is that uh, the capital and uh, the finance market is, is not very equal if we think uh, a global perspective. 
that there are, there are certain countries, there are certain areas where you have a lot of capital and uh, uh, finance opportunities. And then there are many places where you, you have uh, almost no opportunities to get funding. And uh, of course, there is no simple solution to solve that. Uh, of course, the public, public finance and what governments can do is, is sometimes one part of that. Uh, at the same time, I hope that these new platforms and uh, new finance models like microfinance uh, 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 and lending, lending platforms and uh, uh, investing platforms could help. Uh, at the same time, I must say, when I have seen that business long time, it's it's not always easy uh, be, because uh, uh, because the, basically, for example, the startup and the SME finance is, is always quite risky, and and there are not so many parties who are able to participate. But but basically, I think that uh, uh, it's a combination of many things and. Uh, it's it's not realistic to think that there are uh, one or two uh, miracles that can solve the whole problem. Let me just Carolyn, jump in. yeah, I want to jump in. Right. Go ahead, Carolyn. I want to jump in on miracles a bit. Um, uh, I think the conversation, uh, all that has been said, is important, but it's basically iterating on improvements of the existing system. So let's just take financial capital, for example. Less than 10% of venture capital goes to women uh, in terms of women's startups. Uh, the, uh, I, I, uh, I think we could be a lot more ambitious about what's possible. But once you create even more ambition about what's possible, you realize you can't get there from here. But you can get here from there. In, in terms of what really is necessary, because when we think about the sustainable development goals, we've been making a lot of progress, but they are not requisite to the challenge. They are not requisite to what we need for uh, equality, for the climate, in order for us to still be here 50 years from now and being able to have the conversation we have. So, uh, the opportunity to improve existing processes is a critical step, as well as to reimagine and rethink what's possible in terms of the actual conditions that are emergent. That really, so I'll just give you an example. Uh, the estimate is if girls have opportunity for education in an equal way around the world, by 2050, there would be 2 billion less people on the planet than would be if they currently are not, girls aren't increasing their education. So just think about population control and what that would do as a major change to help uh, us move to a thriving place than just trying to survive. So I think we need yes and. You know, Rye, um, can you comment and pick up on Carolyn's point uh, on uh, Vice President Harris travel to uh, Central America uh, promotion now, which we've seen not in the re previous administration, but in prior administrations of a regional development strategy uh, in, in effect as a as a as a alternate to the, the kind of migration we've seen. How do you relate um principles like that to what is possible in Congress in this in this climate. It, it strikes me as a rare kind of potential that we're at least thinking about other countries in a constructive human development way, uh, and albeit from a sort of a negative standpoint. But does that does that provide any template for uh, a, a broader kind of engagement of your group in Congress. Thanks, William. Let me also just first uh, comment on, a, on, on Joku's point. Uh, as an entrepreneur, 
I'm an entrepreneur as well, a um, social entrepreneur. I have three different ventures. One was for, for profit, and then with Honor, of course, is a nonprofit. It's a prior nonprofit um, in Africa called Carolina for Kibera, which is in one of the larger informal settlements. And and the, the comment that he made that really resonated was that um, you know it's very easy for governments to overreach and put in regulations that just don't work for the entrepreneurs. And so I think that when we when we think about forums like the UN, um, and this echoes some of Carolyn's comments, I think, or at least it's, this is what I heard Carolyn from you of, of, around uh, uplifting women. Uh, getting into primary education and then all, and then and then frankly recognizing those and shining a light on those success stories so that others can replicate them. I think that's one of the roles that the international community can do uh, quite well. I think we need to be careful when we start looking at various mandates um, related to supply chains and, and sort of overlaying that, particularly from an international community perspective as opposed to a specific national perspective. Um, with regard to immigration, just one of the, the most frustrating and difficult uh, topics. It's extremely emotionally charged. Um, you know, with honor, uh, we work in uh, Republican districts, we work in Democratic districts uh, across the United States. Um, I do not see a broad package getting passed. I hope that's that I'm wrong. I think that uh, President, former President Bush, is now uh, re- resurfacing a proposal that when he was president, might have passed with broad bipartisan support that relates to immigration holistically. I hope that we can get to that point. Um, what we do see uh, tangibly are two areas in particular that are very important that, uh, that do have some bipartisan support in immigration and might be a starting point. The first is an extremely urgent issue. We're working it at with honor very aggressively. It relates to our interpreters and other allies in Afghanistan who are now being targeted. Their kids are being targeted. Their spouses are being targeted. And um, and and we have a special immigrant visa program that is really broken. Um, so uh, we're, we're trying to put constructive pressure, Republicans, Democrats, et cetera, on the um, uh, Biden administration to develop a more robust and, frankly, urgent plan to take care of these allies, many of whom served by our side in extremely dangerous capacity. That's one area where there's common ground. Uh, the Secretary of State uh, yesterday testified to Congress that, um, that, that, that that's now getting a more urgent attention as well uh, to a Republican chairman that was asking him questions. The second area that I think is extremely important uh, in the United States in particular is re- relates to uh, H-1B, H-1B visas and uh, creating a, a, a way for those uh, individuals that are uh, educated at our top tier universities to stay and frankly fill jobs that are needed. Uh, there is, there's, there's some glimmer of bipartisan promise there. We're working very hard at it at, with honor and with the 25 members of the four country caucus who are, are veterans in the mm-hmm. house. Um, but and maybe just add those two as, um, as comments. So just stepping back, I think uh, broad reform is very difficult right now. I applaud the efforts. I think it's also important to, to try and take bite-sized chunks and actually get some things done and maybe develop some momentum in that regard. Stuart, uh, picking up on some of the threads that uh, that you've heard here on SMEs, on uh, bipartisanship on Congress, do you have any reactions? Yes. Well, first of all, uh, I've been involved in uh, American politics for over 50 years, uh, and I have never seen such a polarized environment as we have now. It's extremely difficult. The only immediate term bipartisan bill that's likely to pass, and I think it will, is one on, ironically, on China to encourage more research and development, more competitiveness in science and technology in order to be able to compete uh, with uh, with China, and that's going to pay us with bipartisan support. I think what Ryan said is tremendously important. We have to take immigration in small bits. For example, rather than trying to have a comprehensive approach and legalize the 11 million or so illegals, we need to start with things like he's talking about that can form a consensus. So there is a large consensus on dreamers, the children who 
came with parents and now have integrated into society, have good records, uh, and the kind of H-1B process. And I will tell you, having been uh, an ambassador, having been under Secretary of State, what's going to happen in Afghanistan in the next year is going to be a catastrophe as we withdraw. And so the notion of getting not just translators, but anyone connected with the U.S. government out and to safe havens is going to be absolutely critically important. It's the least we can do. And then third, I agree so much with what Carolyn and Lisa are saying. The empowerment of women uh, is tremendously important. The false force multiplier of taking people who have been on the sidelines of the economy and bringing them into the mainstream is hugely important and most so in developing countries where they've had the least opportunity. And Ryan, that's one of the great tragedies of what's going to happen in Afghanistan because now we have a generation of young girls who have been you know, educated, young women who are beginning to come into labor force. And if the Taliban takes over, all of that progress may go for naught. Uh, Lisa, what's your reaction from a uh, sort of a pan-Asian perspective? Uh, when you when you uh, deal with your neighbors, um, it, with, with you look at the Australia's relationship with China, as you try and relate that to to these uh, sustainability issues in such a dynamic region of the of the, of the globe, and with the overarching presence of China. How, how is your work related to uh, what some of these themes are that we've discussed uh, other than in specific Asian terms? Uh, well, I mean, Australia is a great ally with the U.S. Obviously, strategically, we have been um, partners with the U.S. for a very long time, particularly on national security issues. Um, um, obviously, we're in a bit of a interesting time here in Australia when it comes to our relationship with China, as probably everybody here might be aware of, um, in terms of um, our trade relationship with China and also, um, I guess, security issues that we are concerned about in um, uh, as well. Um, so the, the interesting thing was that China has been, was our, it, well, our number one trading partner. Um, obviously, they have enacted new barriers uh, for very targeted barriers, by the way, just like they did with the U.S. agricultural system. Um, they, they know exactly where to enact the barriers that will hurt the most. Um, and so um, for Australia's perspective, and I think um, this is where working with the U.S. is going to be really quite important. It's going to be more around looking at the broader Asia Pacific region and working more collaboratively together um uh not just on trade but on national security and also cyber security um i i think australia is a, a big partner with the united states on on dealing with cyber security um and and that's a, a and when you talk about security this is one of the biggest issues we're facing right now um is cyber security threats um so i guess from our perspective it's probably trying to ensure that we work more closely uh, with the United States on issues affecting the Asia Pacific region, and particularly uh, together with 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 what is happening on China, because we are directly impacted by this. We're down to our last minute. Uh, final thoughts, very briefly, from anyone. Well, I would say that what's going to happen in a few months at Glasgow is very important to all the issues we've been mentioning, and the real test will be not just taking a commitment of carbon neutrality. By 2050, that's a piece of paper. Uh, the question is concrete action, and there'll be a request by developed countries to come up with a hundred billion dollar fund, Kuko, in terms of funding for developing countries to give them the opportunity to make the kind of transformations in their economy to make them more energy uh, and green efficient. And the real question is, will the developed world uh, step up and make that kind of uh, funding so that we can have a real collaboration and not have this finger pointing, which I saw in Kyoto in 1997 with developing countries pointing the finger at developed countries. I think we've come a long way, and Glasgow will be a real test. Thank you. You know what? We're, we're out of time. I think it's been an extremely valuable discussion. 
I thank I thank all of you, Lisa, Duco, Rye, Stewart, Carolyn. Appreciate the time. We're all the better for it. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.